Yeah, thank you, thank you, Julian, and and thank you, your excellencies and uh, ambassadors, for sharing your insights. I, I think most of us agree with all your observations and recommendations. Like, uh, I think one of the, I'm an architect, urban planner, uh, with AMCHAM, CANCHAM, uh, European Chamber, and, and German Chamber. Anyway, uh, I think one thing that makes us less globally competitive is really our over-regulated restrictions and so on. And in the real estate sector, one thing that's missing in our country is the real estate investment trust. Our ASEAN, ASEAN neighbors, uh, they invest so much in real estate because uh, real estate investment trust. And the Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs, uh, in the last meeting we had, he asked us to list down all our obsolete laws, useless laws in the Philippines that make us globally competitive. As a foreign observer staying here, you may want to put forward all these useless laws because especially 6040, non-ownership of land by foreigners, even if we put together all the monies of our taipans and tycoons, we'll never make it to the first world. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was one minute. Next lady, there was a person over here. I can't see because of the light. The gentleman there. Uh, good morning. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Philip Dizon. And I'm uh, the president of the American Chamber uh, Davao chapter. Uh, yeah, uh, in the speeches of the uh, speakers, uh, they put uh, primary importance on the uh, uh, Bangsamoro Peace Agreement. And uh, it seems to me that uh, the general picture of Mindanao is that uh, the whole island is a troubled island. But let me remind you that a big portion of Mindanao is not troubled. And that uh, if we are to sustain the economic growth of the Philippines, uh, uh, looking at the uh, report of uh, Secretary Pitilla uh, about the energy situation in the Philippines, uh, and it came out uh, August 26, 2014. Uh, it shows here in the graph that uh, uh, the next coming uh, years, it's only uh, Mindanao that has excess power amounting to about 1,300 to 1,800 megawatts. And Visayas... One minute. <laughs> and Visayas and the rest of the islands are uh, uh, deficit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you so much. Salamat. Uh, I think there's a gentleman right here. Any other people standing up that I can't see? Uh, my name is Volker Steigerwald. I'm from German International Corporation. Um, I was wondering that in all of the statements of the ambassadors, there was actually no mention given to the issue of climate change and environment, which I think is very important for the Philippines. Are you putting a question to a specific ambassador? Actually, whoever wants to say something about that. Does any ambassador wish to comment on that? <laughs> the answer is you're right. There was another gentleman over here. Daniel Fitzpatrick, uh, San Beta Law School. Um, to what extent do the companies uh, from the countries you represent uh, consider the Philippine rules on security of tenure to be a uh, constraint on doing business and expanding employment opportunities for Filipinos? Does any particular ambassador wish to answer that question? Security, state the question very, very briefly, directly, and which ambassador you want to answer. U.S. Ambassador, security of tenure, the inability to uh, terminate an employee's uh, relationship with the business in a relatively efficient and cost-effective manner. Mr. Goldberg. Yes, well, um, I mean, obviously, the, the legal system here is the one that uh, sets those parameters. Uh, and the judicial system is the one that then, adju then adjudicates whether or not those uh, parameters are, are uh, manageable or not. I think uh, AmCham uh, has some views uh, on that in specific. And regarding the, uh, the issue of the judicial system, USAID has a number of programs that are designed to help uh, reduce the clogging in the courts. 
and to make it a more uh, efficient way of getting judgments and decisions. Thank you, Mr. Goldbeck. Gentleman over here. Yes, my name is uh, Eric Lachica from the U.S. Medicare Philippines Campaign. I'm based in Washington, D.C. The major concern of many of our uh, American expats, I think there are almost uh, half a million now in the uh, Philippines, and many of our Balikbayan Filipino Americans, is the lack of Medicare coverage here in the Philippines. Now, uh, will the ambassador, the U.S. Embassy, the Canadian ambassador, uh, recommend extending uh, you know, healthcare coverage, government uh, coverage here. It's a win-win situation, it's cheaper here. So, because apparently over the past few years, it's been the recommendation of the American Chamber of Commerce to endorse Medicare portability, for example. But the U.S. Ambassador has, not, has been reluctant, even recommending that idea of U.S. Medicare coverage here in the Philippines. One for, minute, Mr. Goldbeck. Um, basically, uh, of course, all of that is decided by Congress, not by the State Department. And uh, I'm not allowed to suggest that people lobby Congress. <laughs> so there's no sympathy for our I Americans? I see. Uh, we have an answer. There's a gentleman in the distance over there. Yes, please. I think we have about two more questions after this at the most. No. Oh, well, while you're getting ready, the Canadian ambassador wants to comment briefly on the health. Yeah, just in relation to Canadians traveling abroad under the Canadian health care system, they do have coverage as Canadian citizens when they're traveling abroad, but we recommend that they have additional coverage uh, just in case and also if they choose to reside abroad. But there is coverage provided as long as you're considered a deemed resident of Canada. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, hello, I'm Greg Rushford, uh, American journalist and from Washington, D.C., on assignment from foreignpolicy.com. Uh, the question is for the U.S. Uh, would you mind saying what the longstanding commitment was that prevented Ambassador Goldberg from being here? And uh, would, <laughs> does the U.S. favor giving the Philippines lower tariffs on clothing exports uh, if the clothes are made in at least the typhoon-ravaged areas? Um, in, the, in the first instance, uh, Ambassador Goldberg regularly attends many of these functions. He wasn't available today to do that, unfortunately, so you got me instead. I hope I work. I'd ask why. Well, <laughs> where, where is he? He's not a, he has other commitments as well, I, you know, unfortunately, that's, and those things get in the way. Um, the, the question regarding uh, uh, special tariffs for um, uh, Yolanda-affected regions, uh, that's actually an idea that's been put forward um, in Washington. It's, of course, one that is, uh, needs consideration in terms of how it would be, how it would be implemented uh, and how that would how that'd be managed. There's some question as well whether that is um, doing something like that would be WTO compliant or not, and then how we would be able to actually implement it is another series of questions. Uh, those are all issues that are decided on the Washington side of the pond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I should mention that the ambassador of New Zealand wasn't trying to duck out of questions. He actually had to go to the airport to meet a visitor. So, so uh, apologies that that chair is empty. Are there any more questions from the floor? Gentleman here. I will address this to the, I will address this to the most... Uh, I'm Richard Upton, president of John Robert Powers International, member of MAP, member of the European Chamber. Not a uh, member of the American Chamber. We'll discuss that later. Um, I have reasons. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, I wish you'd take some of your answers more seriously and not as glib. I think the thing about health care shouldn't have been passed off that way, but I'll, I'd like to talk to the to the environmentally friendly people. This gentleman from Germany raised the issue and he was told he was right. Uh, in Manila, we live in probably what is rapidly becoming the most polluted city in the world. And it will affect economic development. It is affecting economic development. What can you gentlemen, such as in New Zealand or uh, uh, in Australia, which keeps its air quite clean, vis-a-vis -vis some of the other countries, what can you do to help these, the major metropolitan areas become aware of this tragedy and what they might do about it? 
Uh, you didn't direct it to a specific uh, yes, ambassador. Do you want to Australian ambassador yeah. to answer Australia that? Australia and New Zealand. The New Zealand, unfortunately, had to go to the airport, so maybe uh, our colleague from Australia will answer that question. Is that working? This is a wonderful moment. I get to speak for two ambassadors at once, and, he, and he's not here to defend himself, although I think his deputy is. Um, look, the short answer to your question is that uh, matters of the environment are built into a lot of what we talk uh, to the Philippines authorities about, both in development cooperation terms uh, and also in terms of how we concert with each other on the international stage. I've seen, I think you've seen, you have European connections, you've seen uh, the, uh, the focus that was put on that by the recent visit uh, by the President of, of France. So across the, the embassies in this, uh, in this uh, country, there's quite a focus on environmental concerns and it's, uh, for example, I, my colleague from Canada uh, raised very helpfully the, the mining industry. It's clearly a, a large uh, part of the focus that we have uh, in uh, the advocacy we do about the mining industry. Um, he's made the point already, I don't need to report, uh, re repeat it, uh, that uh, responsible mining in this country, and let's remember mining is happening here, it's not as though we're coming from a standing start. Mining is happening, not all of it responsible environmentally, socially, uh, or in terms of the return to the, uh, to the good people of this country through the exchequer. But um, a long-winded answer to a simple question, environment uh, does inform uh, what we are doing. Uh, certainly I can speak for me, I'm quite confident I can speak for my New Zealand colleague in his absence. Uh, in the environment and safeguarding the environment is factored into everything we do in our, in our uh, programs here. We uh, have large programs in Mindanao, for example, uh, disaster risk reduction things and, and the environment and, and for that matter gender issues inform uh, what we do across that space. Thank you, Ambassador. The last question from the floor, gentlemen over here. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Genju Lapez, Executive Vice President of Union Bank of the Philippines. This question is directed to Ambassador Reeder. You said a while ago that in your previous experience in Latin America, you uh, are familiar with uh, sustainable and good uh, mining practices. So from your perspective, Mr. Ambassador, what do you think the Philippine government or private industry is missing from this equation? Well, I think, I think we would like a welcoming environment for mining. I think um, every country has its own history, and clearly the Philippines has had a very mixed history in the extractive sector, and we recognize that, and that's something we have to deal with. But I think there's perceptions here that are stuck in a certain time frame in the past that doesn't reflect the extractive industry today, the technologies, the sustainable mining that's pursued, the management of, of mining waste, tailings, the whole cycle of work of a mine today is, is very, very different from uh, perhaps 20 or 30 years ago. I think also in mining legislation, uh, the mining legislation of Chile in particular and Peru are outstanding pieces of legislation which have generated investment and have generated royalties and benefits for the communities. Canada also has a lot of experience in managing the informal sector. There's not much of a discussion in this country about the informal sector. Every time you talk about artisanal mining, people run or ignore it or blame somebody, but it's there. And it's, if I can, it, it's contaminating the perception of the industry because of abuse in that informal sector in terms of abuse of the inputs into the mining sector, abuse of the people who work in the informal sector, and the reality is that the royalties are not being provided to the government and the local barangays, the ore is being smuggled out of the country, there's all kinds of problems. We've had Canadian companies in Latin America who have worked with the informal sectors on the margins of the mines to bring them into the process and manage the sector because I think in this country, sadly, that sector is now colouring the perception of the mining industry and people don't appreciate the advances that have been made. Canada is a good example. We have a quarter of our, nearly a quarter of our GDP comes from the extractive sector. We have 8,000 um, mining sites and active locations abroad that are pursued by Canadian companies. So we have a lot of expertise. We're sharing that. But I think there still is a lot of um, baggage, if you will, from days gone by that affects the perception. And that you really haven't had 
I think, a, a fair playing field and a balanced discussion. And I think particularly you're not addressing the informal sector, which is, I think, the root of many evils in that, in that industry. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, there's been a little development here. One of the great friends of business, uh, the Director General of PESA, has indicated she wants to ask a question. Can I reverse my decision and say I'm open for one more question? Any objections? No, thank you. Thank you very much. This is very short and quick. I, uh, I'm addressing my question to Ambassador Lee. What might have brought the over $22 billion investment of Samsung to Korea? I read in the papers, of course we envy this. We're very envious of all this. What might have brought the investment? I read in the papers that uh, uh, Vietnam, is it Vietnam? Vietnam uh, gave a 30-year income tax holiday. Is this true? Thank you. Ambassador. Well, um, as far as I understand, um, I think there was a strong, very strong will from the Vietnamese leadership actually to attract uh, Samsung company to to invest in, in, the, in Vietnam. I think it was a very, I think, uh, and also the Vietnamese governments government agencies really tried very hard to contact, as I mentioned before, contact the leadership of Samsung uh, and have made connections with them. And, and they have been trying very hard to convince uh, the leadership of Samsung in electronics to invest in Vietnam. I think that's, that's how they succeeded in having huge Vietnamese facilities in, in Vietnam. That's yes, but is it true that they gave 30 years income tax holiday? Uh, income tax holidays. Um, I, I'm sorry that I, have, I don't have much uh, knowledge about that. I will let you know later, okay? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of people put in uh, text messages. We'll endeavor to send you answers to those. I would like on your behalf to thank the ambassadors for their very active and open participation for the first ambassadors panel at an Avocado Forum. Thank you. A big hand for our ambassadors. Before we end, may we request our panelists to remain on stage for a photo opportunity. Before we end, may we request our panelists to remain on stage for a photo opportunity. Thank you. Once again, thank you to our moderator and to our speakers. To start our second panel, let us welcome our speaker, the resident representative for the Philippines of the International Monetary Fund. He joined the IMF in 2001 after completing his PhD in economics at Oxford University and has worked on economies in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Everyone, let's welcome Dr. Shanaka Jayanath Paris. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank the Joint Chambers for inviting me to present this. Uh, I'm going to be pretty quick because I think we are running a bit late. So I have quite a few slides. Uh, yeah, it's up there. So if you can't follow my conversation, since I'm going to be pretty quick, watch the slides. I'm going to take a slightly different tack to this presentation because all of you all are experts on the structural reforms and the challenges in the Philippines. 
So I'm going to give a bit of a global context, global issues to think about what are the challenges in the Philippines and how it could affect the investment climate and the reason to invest now. So you all know that Philippines has been growing fast compared to its ASEAN neighbors after underperforming for a long time. Particularly Q4 growth was quite strong. So Philippines economic growth is doing very well. But as you all, all know, there's a long way to go. If you look at per capita income, 1990 compared to today, we have fallen behind our neighbors. So we have a lot to catch up. From an inclusive growth perspective, unemployment is high. It's one of the highest in emerging markets, especially it's the highest in Asia. But I think more importantly, poverty. Nearly 40% of the population are less than $2 a day. So from an inclusive growth perspective, we have a long and important challenge. So what I'm going to do is focus a bit more on the global trends, outlook, and kind of relate that to the themes we are, are in Arankara, but also the themes we want of investing today for a better future and a more inclusive growth. What's happening in the world? If you look at the world, what's going on right now, we are actually in an investment slump. So if you look, whether it's advanced economies or emerging markets, globally there is virtually no new investment growth. That's a huge concern. What that means is we and nearly everybody else is forecasting that global economic growth in the medium term is going to be much slower than it was in the past. So global economy is going to be much slower than it was in the past, which means it's going to be less demand for exports and less demand for labor and capital, uh, especially from the Philippines. Another interesting trend going on, which is relevant for us, is that if you look at world trade, world trade also is quite anemic, but merchandise exports, so goods export, is growing much slower than service exports. And service exports, we mean lots of services, but also modern services, which means BPOs. So things like BPOs, and service exports are growing much faster than merchandise exports. So when we talk, think about the global economy, especially for the future, we need to really focus on services as well as manufacturing. And if you look at manufacturing globally, especially in middle-income countries like the Philippines, manufacturing share of the economy and employment is stagnating, particularly in employment because of things like robotics, where manufacturing processes are becoming more uh, mechanical. Therefore, it's not easy, like in the past, to have very high labor-intensive growth in manufacturing to solve our inclusive growth problems. So if you look at employment growth, I know it's very hard to read, but hopefully you can have the slides of this. Employment growth today is mainly led by cogn uh, cognitive skill, high skill premium jobs. So we need to focus on, when you think about the future, how to have those high skill jobs. Yes, there is some growth in manual repetitive tasks, especially in East Asia, where we are still somewhat competitive. But it is very difficult to secure good jobs for us if we do not focus on the skills, which will be the future job engine in the world. And on the right side, I'm just showing you that the countries which really are creating jobs, even this, in this global slump, are the guys who are investing. So investment, the theme of investment today of this forum is absolutely the right one. What about Philippines' potential? We all know the demographic dividend is really the Philippines' potential to create jobs, achieve inclusive growth, and other factors which are probably important part of this is the large English-speaking workforce. We have in natural endowments, agriculture, mining, tourism potential is very clear. But something which we also need to realize is that our productivity in agriculture is very low. So raising productivity in agriculture could be a very 
important way to raise incomes, but also free labor to go into services and in manufacturing. And services and manufacturing, there's always a debate, is Philippines focused too much on services? Is it manufacturing? Uh, is it not really taking off? But really, the important aspect here is that services and manufacturing, especially in the future, is gonna be a big complement to one another. And that could be Philippines' competitive advantage, using services to make its manufacturing more competitive and broad-based it. We all know to achieve these things, Philippines' fundamentals compared to the previous decade, today's fundamentals must stronger, which is what's important to sustain a growth takeoff. And I think the important point, in the past, Philippines' labor force was relatively expensive. So unit labor cost in the Philippines was high. But today, because wage growth in the Philippines is very well anchored, unit labor cost that means wages adjusted for productivity, has, hasn't been growing fast. So the labor is very productive. So we could attract more la uh, jobs, including from investors moving out of China. So labor is productive, but if you look at manufacturing labor productivity, Philippines is still low. So it's not only about wages. We need to raise manufacturing productivity, labor productivity. That requires improvements in investment in infrastructure, in many other aspects. So we are not going to attract all those investments from China just by only having a low wage. We need to improve manufacturing and labor productivity, which you can see we are far behind China and many other economies in the world. So how do we increase productivity? We are already seeing that Philippines is doing well in, the, in, in, the, in services, especially in modern services, which I mean BPOs. That's raising productivity, and maybe greater productivity application in different areas could help. An uh, area which Philippines falls behind is export diversification. So the economy is not well diversified enough. So I'm not sure whether you want to focus on whether one sector is too small, another sector is too small, but it's very clear diversification is low. So focusing on diversification will help raise our productivity. And this is where I think it's very clear the theme of this uh, Arankada is, fun, uh, this year's theme is investment now is absolutely right. Because Philippines investment, or you all know, is the lowest in the region, right? So it's very clear that we have to invest more. Uh, and the areas of investment which we should focus on, I think Bill already went through the areas. I, of course, like this cobweb from the same World Economic Forum indexes. You can see where Philippines falls behind compared to the ASEAN 3 and the other advanced economies. Infrastructure, institutions. We also have some issues on our labor market uh, and innovation side, and, right? So, including healthcare. Another area I think we should not forget about is the social and human capital which is required to sustain faster growth. So, I think these areas which are very much covered by Bill, also very much articulated in the Arankada and all the structural reforms we need to achieve progress in these areas are fairly well mapped out. Now it's really about investing and implementing. I think a very clear area which falls, I think I want to emphasize a bit more is infrastructure. At the IMF, one of the themes we have right now for the global economy is that we need to invest in public investment for infrastructure especially. And uh, this, this first, the left chart is actually from McKinsey, but we have also are doing a new theme for this year, the IMF, on looking at public infrastructure stock, how much public infrastructure there is in countries compared to optimal level. McKinsey said it's 70% of GDP, but if you look at what Philippines needs to do to increase its infrastructure stock to what would be optimal, there's a long way to go. And one way to get there, which we've seen is important. Yes, PPPs are important. We need to crowd in private investment. But the public investment is needed to start the process. So I think it's time for a public investment surge in the Philippines, globally, but especially in the Philippines. 